praise this morning. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. We thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord. Even as we share your word, Lord, I pray for your presence. I pray that you speak to us, Lord. Convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. May you set the captives free, Lord. May you bring healing and deliverance in the name of Jesus. We give you glory and we give you honor, my master. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. John chapter 19, I'll be doing a bit of work this morning, a bit of teaching, a little bit of preaching, uh, just to, to allow God to do what he wants to do today. John chapter 19, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then say to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting, sitting there, and they filled a spoon with sour wine, put it on, on his soap and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. I'm gonna to talk today uh, about the last bit of that verse, second from last, the words that Jesus said, the three in English, which says, it is finished. I'm going to focus mainly on those three in English, but the, I think we all understand that the Bible was, uh, or is a translation, was translated, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew at first. So it then got translated into different languages. So when you want to do a full study of the Word of God and get a good understanding of it, you've got to go to the original Hebrew because in translation there is loss and gain that happens. So if you go to the original, you get a much deeper meaning than what you can see on the surface. So it's been translated into different languages. And the New Testament was originally written in Greek there is some Aramaic that was also used in the New Testament, but originally uh, in Greek. So if you also want to get a deeper meaning of the word of God, and you are serious about studying his word, and get a deeper understanding, you also go to, to the Greek, original Greek, and get a deeper, a much, much deeper meaning. Now, what's very important and what's missing today is a believer's struggling or failing to interpret the Bible. Just reading it uh, on the surface and they are not properly interpreted. This is this account for so many misteachings or wrong teachings that are happening in the church today because people are not going deeper with the word. So for today's purposes, we have looked at these three words in English, which is finished. The original Greek version is tetelestai. Tetelestai. Tetelestai uh, is a word 
that originates from the word teleo, which is T-E-L-E-O, which means it has been accomplished, it has been finished, it has been completed. But now, when we are looking at this word, the Celestai, many people I've been reading around, they see much deeper than we can see on the surface. The Greek people uh, in, and the Roman during that time, they believed much more in what they call a sea of matter in a drop of language. I'll explain that. A sea of matter in a drop of language. So in other words, one could speak one word and mean 10,000 things. <coughs> so to them, they attributed that to the perfection of oratory, to say this is a great speaker. They were not looking at somebody who could speak so many words, but somebody who could choose the right word to say at the right time, and that would mean much deeper than anybody can see. So now, Jesus at this point, these are his last words in John. In other, maybe when we go to Matthew, uh, after he said it is finished, he also says, Father, in thy hands I commit my spirit. Now, what we see when Jesus is on the cross of Calvary, he says seven statements. We're not really going to, to, to look at this, but mainly that. Seven different statements. Father, in your hands I commit my spirit. Uh, when he say, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachitan, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, he said different statements that he said on the cross. But the last one, it is finished, is the most powerful of all. It's the climax. So that's what we are looking at today. This is the climax, climax of Jesus' ministry. <coughs> he says, it is finished. And we want to look at what is, is it, what exactly is he talking about? Tetelestai is in the perfect tense. So if it is in the perfect tense, what it means is, it was finished 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. It was finished in eternity past. It is finished today, and it is also finished in eternity. So, when he died on the cross and he says, it is finished, and we hear that he gave up or dismissed his spirit, he was not like he forced to die. He was not like um, somebody who was struggling or battling for life on the cross. But the Bible says he dismissed his spirit, which means he willingly gave up his spirit. He was willing to die for you. And the Bible says, greater man is no man than this. <laughs> that, that a man gave up his life for his brethren. Died for his brethren. This is what Jesus did. He died for you and I. But as he was on that cross, he was carrying the sin of the world. That's why when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. He was carrying the sin of you and I on that cross. And even before he went to the cross, I think we see him again in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says, Sweat came down like drops of blood. And he cried out unto him who was able to save him from death. And we hear him saying, Father, if it were possible, let this cup pass away. But let it not be my will, but thine, as he's there. And on his way, we hear they put a crown of thorns on his head. And to those of you putting it in context, these thorns were not small thorns or the nettles that you see. They were like big, almost this size, these thorns. And they would actually penetrate deep into the skin. So he bled from his head. <coughs> a 
and this crown of thorns was put on his head. And they did it to mock him that he is king. Little did they know that they actually meant he was or is indeed the king. So they crowned him the crown of thorns. And we see him as he goes again on his way. Pilate says, I have nothing to do with this man. But he ordered him to be scared. And as he's been scared, actually, I think I've heard that this, this was not a laughing matter. Some people could actually die during the scathing process. Some people would not make it to the cross. They would die during scathing. Because these scathing, they actually, you know, these seven different stripes. And they, were, they, they had some metal, you know, that was attached to, 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 to the stripes. And as they were really whipping the person, it would rip off the skin. So he was being whipped, your savior. And the skin was being ripped from his back. This is why the Bible says, by his stripes, you are healed. So when we are talking about the stripes of Jesus, you want to imagine and look at what he went through for you and I. He went through that suffering for you to be set free. He went through that suffering for your sins to be forgiven. And we see him now when he's on the cross. We hear that because it was almost Sabbath. And they ordered that they need to break the legs uh, of, of the people who were on the cross. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. What did they do? A spear on his side. And the blood, as the Bible says, blood and water came out of his body. Now, and this was happening again, that was the blood of Jesus being shed for you. He says, it is finished. This is deep. I was looking at this and I was saying, God, there is no way to describe this. It is too deep. Nobody can understand it. Tetelestai. It is too wide. Nobody can go around it. You know, the breadth, the length, the depth of it, the depth of these words. This is the very climax. This is the word of the Bible. This is prophecy being fulfilled. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. You must know when you look at the New Testament, this is Jesus. It is the prophecy in the Old Testament fulfilled in him. Jesus Christ. They say the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. In other words, Jesus who is concealed in the Old Testament. But when you come to the New Testament, is the, it is actually the Old Testament now revealed. All those things that we hear hearing from the prophets, the 300 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament, they are being fulfilled now in Jesus. And he says, it is finished. Now, we just want to look at some things, just do a little bit of explaining. We'll go through some slides, about six of them that I have. And we just want to explain some of the things that were implied by this very word when he says, it is finished. This is what Jesus did for you. Shall we go to the next one, please? Right, okay. When Jesus died on the cross, he accomplished many things. And some of the things that he accomplished are the ones that we are going to, to be looking at one by one. What he did was, that word is expiation. This is what Jesus did. He removed. Not only did he remove sin from you, but he removed sin and guilt. What would be happening today in the body of Christ, in the church today, are so many people. We have come from different backgrounds who are being hounded day and night by sin or sins that they committed many years ago. And 
when you go to sleep, the enemy is trying to remind you. But I've got good news today that when Jesus is saying it is finished, this is what he meant. He removes not only sin, but the guilt. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that there is therefore no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. He has removed the guilt from you. That you have no reason for, for you, there is no reason for you to be feeling guilty anymore. There is no reason for you to be accused or be condemned of things that you did yesterday or even this morning if you have confessed of it because Jesus died for you. When he died for you on the cross of Calvary and you come to him and you say, Lord, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You confess of your sin, you become justified. He looks at you just as if you never sinned. He is not like people who continue to remind you of your wrongs. He justifies you. So we enter into his presence by the righteousness of Jesus. You are declared righteous because the righteousness of Jesus is imputed on you. Right? It's not your own righteousness that qualifies you to enter into the holy place. But in the righteousness of Jesus, because he is sinless. He is without fault. So he carries you in there and you are going into his presence and you are saying, because Jesus qualified me. John chapter 1 verse 29. And this is John the Baptist who is talking and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you go again to the Old Testament, Isaiah 53 verse 6. The Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him, on Jesus. Hmm. And again, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Of himself. He sacrificed himself, went on that cross, and Jesus has been revealed to take away sin from you. To take away guilt from you. The Bible says sin has no more dominion over you. <laughs> it has no power over you. The only right of entry that the devil has on you is if you have unconfessed sin. If you have got unconfessed sin or you haven't given your life to Jesus, the devil has got a claim on your life. But I've got good news for you today. It is finished. He has died for you and he has declared that it is completed, the work is accomplished, mission accomplished. Amen. What they used to do again during this time is if somebody owed some money, right, and borrowed some money, and then you pay off that money, they will write on the receipt, settle a star. It is completed. <coughs> the debt has now been paid. It is now cancelled. It's finished. It's completed. Settle a star. And some prisoners, when they went into prison, what they would do, they would write on their prison cell, a cell, sorry, the crime they've committed. Right? Once they've paid the penalty, if they were sentenced, say, to 10 years, they've saved the 10 years, they would take off all that writing and write Settle a star. They will give them letters to walk with, and on those letters they will write Tetelestai. So if anybody wanted to accuse them of what they did in the past, they only bring out this certificate which says Tetelestai. It's paid for. That's what you need to do to the enemy. When the devil is trying to accuse you, Tetelestai. Jesus has died, has died for you. He's done it all for you. And the second thing, next slide, please. The second thing that Jesus did as well, I'm using another word, uh, which is called propitiation. 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 Now, more than just removing the sin and the guilt, what Jesus did was the removal of the wrath of God on him. 
Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So Jesus, when he went on the cross and he said it is finished, he's saying the wrath of God is no longer upon you. Because when God is looking at you, he sees his son. He sees the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary. He sees that the blood of Jesus is sufficient or was sufficient to pay for your sin. Mm. The blood of Jesus is all sufficient to atone for every sin ever committed and ever to be committed. Any sin you can think of, the blood of Jesus is the only price that could pay for that. So you've been delivered from the wrath of God. You've been set free from sin. You've been set free from guilt from shame, from condemnation, from accusation. You have been set free from that. What you need as a child of God is to be able to reach out and receive that. Because the Bible says, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. If you don't know, the devil will just torment you, hound you day and night. And you struggle in your Christian walk because you don't know you have been set free. <laughs> You don't know what your freedom means. Because the Bible says it is for freedom that he has set us free. It is for freedom that you have been set free. Tetelestai. time. It is finished. Romans chapter 3, from verse 25 to 26. He displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was meant to demonstrate his righteousness. Mm. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of him who has faith in Jesus. So in other words, for somebody who has got faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus has already paid the price. He, he is the propitiation in his own blood. The wrath of God is no longer upon you. Don't allow the enemy to come through your mind, through other people. There are some people who can remind you, we know you. Oh, you are saying you are a Christian? We know, but we saw you the other day. You know, the enemy will try to remind you of mistakes you have made in the past. There is therefore no more condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Some people are struggling even to, to, to be free, to enjoy, you know, the beauty of the Lord, to enjoy the presence of the Lord because of things that they've done in the past. Tetelestai. time. It is finished. Mm. Hebrews chapter 2, 17. Christ made propitiation for the sins of the people. Mm. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, just for, for your reference, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Right. It's not by your works that you have been saved. You have been saved by grace through faith. It's not because you love God so much, that's why you are forgiven. It's because he has loved you beforehand. <laughs> he loved you before the foundation of the world. Before you were born, he loved you. <laughs> and he continues to love you. It's regardless of what you do or what you have done, he does not love you any less. And when he sees the sacrifice of his son, he loves you even more and deeper. And he's saying, Tetelestai us die today. You have been liberated. You have been set free. <laughs> it's you to take that step today and say, I'm not going to continue around in circles. <clears throat> and I was praying, you know, the Lord was just revealing to me that sometimes we've gone through patterns which are called cycles. <clears throat> uh, you know, patterns of doing well, doing well, and praising God, and things are really going well, and before you know it, you are back again. You are down again. 
He said, Tetelestai. Let's start there. It is finished. There is no reason for you to go through those cycles. There is no reason for you to go through those patterns again. Because he paid the price for you. It's for you to rise up and say, no more. It's not happening anymore. I've been liberated. I've been set free. The blood of Jesus has been shed for, for me. For my freedom. It is for freedom that you've been set free. And this one is deeper. Next slide. Uh, uh, reconciliation. Reconciliation. You must know that what sin did is when Adam fell. When Adam fell, it means men were separated from God. There was a chasm between men and God. There was a gap between men and God because of sin. And we have been alienated and separated from God because of sin. But what Jesus has done, God planned in eternity past, in the past, long before the foundation of the world, he planned a solution. You remember what he says in Genesis chapter 3, he says there shall be enmity between you and, 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 uh, and the woman, meaning to the serpent, and also the woman's seed, right, and you. He says you shall bruise his heel, but he shall do what? Crush your hands. This is what Jesus has done now. This is the crushing blow. The serpent could only bruise. But as for the seed of the woman, if you check your Bibles, that seed is in capital letter. I think Genesis chapter 3, 15. Uh, it's a capital letter, meaning to say it's repairing to the seed of the woman who is Jesus. So we can see the planning of God well beforehand that the, Jesus was going to come and he was going to crush the head of the serpent. And now he comes here and he says, it is finished. When the, when the devil heard him saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabakitan, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was maybe rejoicing that maybe he's not going to go through this. It's too painful. But Jesus went through that. And then now he says, it is finished. It has all been completed. <coughs> Mission accomplished. He say, he's not saying, I am like a soldier or a warrior who is, who is just coming out, uh, you know, and I just survived. But he's saying, I've done all that I was sent to accomplish. You remember in John chapter 4, when the disciples came back and they saw Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, and, uh, you know, they, they were speaking to him, and he said, my meat is to do, or my food, is to do the, one, the work of the one who sent me, and to do what? To finish it. So Jesus was not here, was not sent here on earth, you know, just to come and perform miracles and go. He came to die, and die for you and I. I did ask this question in Sunday school. I was really impressed by the answer that I had from one of the youngsters. He said, why did Jesus come? And one of them said, he came to die. This is the reason why he came. He came to die for you and I, that you could be liberated today. You could be reconciled to God. So you have been alienated, but now you are being reconciled back to God. Romans chapter 5, verses 10 to 11. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So through the death of Jesus, you have been reconciled back to God. You are now you enjoying fellowship with God, something that you could not enjoy in time past, you remember they were sacrificing bulls, they were sacri sacrificing gods, they were trying different types of blood, but now by the blood of Jesus, he have got clear entry into his presence because of the blood of Jesus. He have been reconciled to God. He have been adopted into the family of God. And the Bible says you are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places 
far above all principalities, far above all powers, far above all dominion, far above all authorities. And today you can say, I am a child of God, and the devil is under my feet. Because positionally, spiritually, you are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Which means you have been made co-heirs together with Christ and the saints of God. <clears throat> you qualify now. You are qualified by the death of Jesus Christ. And when he says tetelestai, start, he is saying all those things that ever happened in the past. I have blotted out. It's, you are no longer held accountable because all the sins, everything, all the guilt, the condemnation, They've been put on Christ, and Christ triumphed over them. So in other words, he, all the sin was put on him, piled on him. That's why he was temporarily separated from God. And when he was saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabakita, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God could not countenance the sin that was on Jesus. So temporarily he was separated for that period while he was on the cross. And the sin now is removed completely when he says it is finished. Imagine how painful. It was unnatural for him to be separated from the Father. But for that period, because of the sin that he was carrying, he was separated from God. Next slide, please. Redemption. I always want to talk about redemption and give an example. Now, it says deliverance from bondage, deliverance from captivity, through the payment of a ransom or price, we are delivered from the power of sin. Right? So, this is what happens. I know we always talk about this word and say redeem, redemption, and everything. But it's very important as a believer for you to know what exactly Jesus did. You were delivered from bondage, you were a slave to sin. We are singing, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I'm now a child of God. If you are a slave to something, it means you do exactly what that thing or person asks you to do. If you are a slave to sin, because I used to be as well before I got saved, if you are a slave to sin, you obey that sin. It dictates to you. It tells you what to do. It tells you when to do it. It tells you where to go because it becomes a habit. Now we have in the house of God believers who are in bondage to sin. We've got believers who are in bondage to sin because they don't know that Jesus is saying, Tetelestai, it is finished. And you find yourself, you have no control. You can't control your body, you can't control your mind. You can't control your emotions, your thoughts, because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What comes out of your mouth, you have no control, because you don't know that you have been delivered. You were in bondage, and the devil would dictate to you what to say, how to say it. It doesn't matter if it hurts somebody else, because the devil is in control. But if you allow Jesus to be in control, what you say, the Bible says, it's seasoned with salt, bring grace to the hearer. Which means when people hear you talk, you know they are going to be nourished, they are going to be encouraged. But if Jesus is not in control, the, the plan of the enemy is to bring discord, division, and to destroy other people. In your body, you can't control the things that you do. I always talk even particularly to young people. You say, you have control. You can't tell me it's the hormones. You can't tell me it's this. You have control over that with Jesus. <laughs> he gives you power to overcome. <laughs> because this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You need to be telling yourself every morning you get up, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So sin has no dominion over me. Things that happen to you, the devil is preying on your ignorance. The devil is preying on your mind because you are ignorant of your freedom. 
He has set you free. When the Son of Man sets you free, you'll become free indeed. He didn't die for nothing. Listen, there's no more blood that is going to be shed again. The blood of Jesus has already been shed. <laughs> Once and for all. And he's saying, tetelestai. time. It is finished. There is no more sacrifice that's ever going to qualify you to be set free. The blood of Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He has paid the ransom. In other countries, if they, they, they could kidnap or capture somebody and then they demand a ransom to say we want a million pounds before if you want to see your daughter or your son alive. Jesus came and he paid the price. <laughs> he, he came as a ransom for, for mankind for us to be set free. And we have been redeemed. We have been redeemed through Jesus Christ. From the power of sin. Mm. If you go to 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 to 19, it says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your future way of life inherited from your fathers, but with the precious blood, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ Jesus. <clears throat> you were not redeemed. You were not redeemed with things that perish, not with silver or gold. You were not redeemed, you know, through your education or through your connections. You can't go through to God through the back door because you know somebody else. I always speak to my children, I say, you, your relationship with God is between you and God. Right. You can't get to God through me. Because Jesus is the only one who says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by Him. So in other words, what we are saying is, you have not been redeemed by things that perish, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You have been redeemed by that blood. You have been bought at a price. The precious blood of Jesus. You remember the common scripture that every believer, when he comes into the kingdom, get to know about, you know, John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but we have everlasting life. Yes. Because of his love he said there is nobody else who is qualified. There is nothing else qualified to die for humanity. Nothing else qualified to buy men back to myself but my son. And he sent his son Jesus to die for you. And today you are redeemed. You have been set free. Mm. You have been redeemed from the guilty, the guilt of sin. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, 24. We justified as a gift by his redemption through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So in other words, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short. <coughs> so in other words, every man has sinned. And we have fallen short of the glory of God. And now he's saying you have been redeemed. You have been purchased through Christ Jesus. And Galatians chapter 3, 13 to 14. You have been redeemed from the curse of the law. Very important. Thank you, Jesus. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He has been become a curse for us. So in other words, the Bible says, Cursed is he that he hangs upon a tree. So Jesus went and he hung on the tree. He became a case for you. So all those cases that you hear about, to say, oh, some people will call you cursed, your family is cursed, and this one is cursed and everything. You say, he has become a case for me. That's right. He has died on the cross for me. That's right. <laughs> and the Bible says he has removed the case. There is no reason for you to be condemned. There is no reason for you to be accused anymore. The case has been removed. It's been taken away. 
if your mind is trying to play uh, trying to play around with you and accuse you you say i have been delivered i have been redeemed the case has been removed it has been taken away and i am free as a child of god you have been set free through the blood of jesus first corinthians chapter 6 Verse 20, you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your bodies. So in other words, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you want to glorify God in your body, because you have been redeemed. You have been bought back. I give an example of uh, a pawn shop to say, uh, if you want some money, you are desperate for money. I've seen lots of people do it. You take your phone, to the pawn shop, give them your phone, they say they will value it, and they'll say, okay, your phone is uh, worth, say, 100 pounds, right? And say, okay, can I have 100 pounds, please, in cash? We are desperate for cash. You leave your phone there, and if you want to redeem it, they will say, you can redeem it within 14 days, right? So after the 14 days, you turn up at the pawn shop, and you say, okay, I want my phone back. Remember, they gave you 100 pounds, but when you want it back, you are not going to give them 100 pounds. You are going to give them 150 pounds or more to get your phone back. It was yours in the first place. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's a, so what we see now, we belonged to God. We were created in God's image. But now Adam lost the list, right? When he sinned, and we were separated from God. So for us to come back to God, to be reconciled to God, there was a price that was needed to be paid. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. So for us to be redeemed from that death, from the penalty of sin, the punishment of sin, a price needed to be paid. And only the precious blood of Jesus was found worthy to pay the price. But this is what happened. You have been redeemed. Now, the next slide, please. You, thank you, please. Jesus defeated the powers of darkness. He defeated all the powers of darkness. When he said it is finished, it meant all the powers of darkness, all the powers of the enemy have been defeated. Remember what he says in Luke chapter 4, he says, Behold, I give you authority, I give you power to feed upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus defeated the powers of darkness. On that cross, when he said it is finished, it means the devil has no more room. Jesus did not leave any unfinished business. He finished it all. And he said it is finished. So the powers of darkness defeated. The devil has no power, has no authority over you because you are a child of God. The devil has no place in your life unless you give him. If you open the door to him, you come in and feast. Yes. But what has happened here, Jesus has finished. Has it's called a crushing victory. The cry of Jesus that we hear on the cross when he says, it is finished, Tetelestai. It is a cry of a mighty warrior who has conquered. It is not a cry of somebody who is looking for someone to come and comfort them, mm -hmm. but it's a cry of victory. Mm -hmm. Tetelestai. It is finished. He has overcome the powers of darkness. Now, Colossians chapter 2 puts it really good. Chapter 2 is verses 13 to 15. Oh, verse, verse, verse 15. Uh, we can look at that verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is what he's done. From verse 18, you can see that. You being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, 
He has made a life together with him. Have you forgiven you all your trespasses? Is he forgiven you how many trespasses? Oh. All. Sad. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This is what Jesus has done. He's made a public spectacle of the enemy. He's made a public spectacle of him, brought him to open shame, and by his cross, he has been liberated. He has defeated all the powers, all the principalities, all the dominion. He has overcome that and has defeated that on your behalf. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the last point that we want to look at is, um, let's go to the next slide, please. Jesus, this is called, when people are talking about in theology, the big words and everything, it's called substitutionary atonement. <laughs> a bit <laughs> big, but bigger than what it means anyway. <laughs> right, he died as a substitute. Right? If you remember the story of uh, Isaac, right? Abraham did not have a child, and then God gave him a son, Isaac, right? So this is a good story that, that actually gives, uh, it clarifies substitution, right? So Isaac, sorry, uh, Abraham was now commanded to take Isaac, uh, you know, to the mountain that God was directing him and to go and sacrifice Isaac, his son, whom he loved. And uh, Abraham takes Isaac with him. And when he goes to that, uh, that mountain, uh, he's prepared the wood, put his son, bound his son, put him on the altar. He's about to uh, sacrifice his son. And then he hears a voice speaking and saying to him, do not, I've seen that you love, you love me. Seeing that you have not withheld, withheld your only son from me, uh, now do not kill your son. And then he lifted up his eyes, the Bible says, and he sees a ram which is trapped by its horns. And then he took that one, that one that's where Jehovah Jireh comes from. He says, at the mound of the Lord, it shall be provided. So he said, Jehovah Jireh has come through. He has provided a lamb for sacrifice. But on his way, he had already told Isaac. When Isaac said, I can see we have got the wood. I can see we have everything. But where is the hand for the offering? And Abraham said, the Lord himself will provide. And when he goes to that mountain, we can now see God provide. Mm -hmm. So that lamb was actually sacrificed on behalf or in the place of Isaac. This is what Jesus has done. Jesus has come, he's died in your place. Because you sinned, it doesn't matter how small in your eyes the sins you have committed. We are all adults here. We have sinned at one point or we sin every day. Yeah. Uh, right? Whatever you have done, you deserve to die. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So Jesus came and then he died in your place. This is what Jesus has done. He's paid the price in full. Tetelestai, time. Paid in full. He has died in your place. And we want to pray this afternoon. Just listen. God helping us. We want to pray this afternoon. Thank you, Jesus. We want people who are fed up of living defeated lives. <laughs> we want to pray together for people who are fed up of living defeated lives. You have been called to a life of victory. <laughs> because your Savior, your Master, has overcome. Jesus has said, Tetelestai. There is no reason for you to live in defeat and failure all the time. And you are kicking yourself and saying, Oh, why, why, did, you, why did I do that again? <laughs> Jesus is saying, Tetelestai. He has set you free. It is for freedom that you have been set free. 
Some sicknesses, I'm not saying all of them, some sicknesses come through because of sin as well. Right? So when, when one, one commits sin, sin can open the door to sickness, to infirmity, to fear, to phobias, mm. to anxieties, to depression because of sin. And Jesus is saying, Tetelestai. It is finished. He is paying the price for that. When we pray, sometimes we pray for the symptom. And we are not going to the root of the problem. The root of the problem could be sin, and we are busy praying for the headache. It's only a symptom. The Bible says, how can a man enter a strong man's house and take his possession unless he first binds the strong man? So what we want to do this afternoon is bind the strong man in the name of Jesus. We pray that Jesus will set you completely free and you can enjoy your freedom in Christ Jesus. You can walk in victory, you can walk in freedom because of what Jesus has done. He said, Tetelesta. Shall we stand? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I thank you. I give you praise this afternoon because of the finished work of Calvary. You say, Lord Jesus, Tetelestai, it is finished. And I pray this afternoon, Lord, that you set us completely free. Anybody who might be battling and struggling because of different areas, oh God, I pray, Lord, that your word cannot lie. I pray that you set them completely free right now. For it is for freedom that you have set us free. Thank you, mighty Father, for breaking every chain. Thank you for breaking every shackle that has been tying us to bondage. Thank you, mighty Father, for salvation. I thank you for delivering in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. May you reveal yourself, O oh God, to us, Lord, even as we pray this afternoon. In Jesus' name. I'll just ask you. Thank you.